Your Holiness, good morning. Uh, we are very happy to gather here again and to have Adele Diamond making this morning's presentation. In Adele Diamond, we have a unique combination of uh, development, the developmental psychologist, a person who has been investigating children's and their development and the effects on their brain development. So in, she's also a cognitive neuroscientist and today's presentation will be about what are the effects of attention training in children and how that can be improved. So please Adele, thank, thank you, you very much. Very much. Good morning. I'm going to, uh, the main purpose of my talk is to talk about what skills and attributes are important for success in school and in life, and how we can help young children to develop those critical skills. Uh, the outline of my talk is I'm going to define what executive control is and talk about why it's important. Then I'll say a little bit about its development, um, how to help children improve their executive control, lessons from one approach in doing that, and other ways to improve children's executive control. Executive you want to, you want yes. to define what you mean. Executive control refers to a set of three cognitive skills that rely on a region of the brain known as prefrontal cortex. One, one of these cognitive skills is inhibitory control, inhibition. The ability to resist a strong inclination to do one thing and instead do what's most appropriate or needed. So for example, inhibition of distractions, whether internal or external, is needed for focused or selective attention. The ability to inhibit acting impulsively and instead make a better response enables you to resist saying something socially inappropriate or hurtful. For example, suppose there's an old friend that you haven't seen for 20 years, and maybe your first reaction on seeing your friend is, my God, how much weight you gained. But you don't say that. You inhibit saying that and say something to make your friend feel better. Um, it, you also need inhibition to resist uh, impulsively hurting somebody else, to get back at that person for hurting you. To, you also need inhibition to stay on task despite boredom, initial failure, or interesting digressions. That requires the ability to inhibit strong inclinations to give up or to do something more fun. In other words, discipline. In Inhibition allows us a measure of control over our attention and our actions so that we're not controlled by external stimuli, our emotions, or old habits of mind or behavior. It doesn't mean it makes it easy, it just makes it possible. Thus, inhibition helps make change possible. The second um, core executive control skill is working memory, holding information in mind while mentally working with it. Much of my work has focused on situations where you need to hold information in mind and also exercise inhibitory control. I will show you examples later. But I can say now that it is the norm that to do either hold information in mind or exercise inhibitory control, you usually need the other. They, they usually go together. <laughs> The third core executive control skill is cognitive flexibility, being able to easily and quickly switch perspectives or the focus of attention, flexibly adjusting to change demands or priorities. Cognitive flexibility is critical for creative problem solving. What are other ways I can react when something happens? What are other ways I can conceptualize a problem, maybe think of it as an opportunity? What are other ways I can try to overcome a problem? 
What, why does one child get good grades and another poor ones? That depends far more on discipline, an aspect of inhibitory control, than it does on IQ. I predict that improving young, young children's executive control will help them succeed in and be more likely to graduate from school and will reduce the incidence or severity of mental health disorders of executive control, such as ADHD, attention deficit disorder, or addictions. Okay, now I'm to the development of executive control. Um, uh, prefrontal cortex, on which executive control depends, is the last area of the brain to fully mature. It's not fully mature until your 20s. So this, this let me do it so that everybody can see. This shows the development over years from 5 to 20. In the youngest years, you see the, the blue and the purple show the most mature levels. So you can see that motor cortex, primary motor cortex, and primary sensory cortex, like visual cortex, mature early. But even at age 17, prefrontal cortex is not fully mature. It matures very late. So executive control takes a long time to fully develop. Executive control is the characteristic most predictive of school readiness. Sadly, kindergarten teachers report that over half their children lack effective executive control skills and that poor executive control is their single most difficult challenge in teaching. One characteristic of executive control in children is very poor inhibition. We adults... Inhibition is like that. Quiet. But it's like, not me, you know, but you know, it's like, you know, 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 you know. We adults may not appreciate how extremely difficult inhibition is for young children because it's less difficult for us. So I wanted to give an example. And um, I think that to understand things, it's best to experience it yourself. So this is a test we use to study executive control in children as young as four through adults. So imagine you have a response button for each thumb. Okay, everybody has a button for each thumb. And one rule is that when you see a heart, you press on the same side as the heart. So here you would press with your left thumb, okay? The other rule is that when you see a flower, you press with the thumb on the opposite side, okay? The hearts are easy because everyone's natural tendency is to activate the hand on the same side as the stimulus. But flowers require you... So can you repeat that a bit? Um, Why is it easier? There's a, it's um, built into the nervous system of all animals that when you see something on the left or the right, your hand, your body also tends to get activated. Okay? So when you have the rule that you press on the opposite side, you have to inhibit that. And then when the rules are mixed together, you have to flexibly switch between them. So first, we're going to do heart trials. So you only press on the same side as the heart. Is everyone ready? Susu 
So you need your thumbs ready. You, are you ready? Yes. Good. Thank you. Okay. So heart, same side. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, the name go for it. I don't know. <laughs> uh, you you press as if press you have a button. Yes, good. Okay. So now you will only see flowers. So now you always press on the side opposite the flower. This is different. Okay. Okay. Get this too. I don't think my difference is. No, you're right. Now you're going to get both flower trials and heart trials. So remember, heart same side, flower opposite. Heart same side, flower opposite. Are you ready? Do the dangerous, and then you do the dangerous. This is Ning Kawai and Ticho Nems. Meto Kawai and Ko Tocho Nemburis. Cho. You need to try, otherwise you won't appreciate what I have to say. <laughs> you, won't, it, you need to experience it, otherwise you can't understand. Okay, good luck. Okay, most people find that last part harder. If you look at the performance of adults, we find the, the uh, uh, just doing flowers or just doing hearts are the same, just like you said. We're just as fast and we're just as accurate if we only have hearts or we only have flowers. But if you do what David talked about with mixing them together, we're less accurate and we're slower over here, okay? And you see the same thing in children. At all ages, the mixed condition is much harder when you have to flip between the rules. But this is the important point. Now, His Holiness said, the heart and the flowers were no different, and that's true for all adults. H doing only flowers or only hearts are equal, but that's not true for children. From all the ages we studied, whether they're four years old or 13, which is as old as we studied, if you have to do flowers, you're worse than if you just do hearts. Even though every trial is a flower, it's not harder for us, but it's harder for children. So at every age we studied, children were slower and less accurate on the flower block than on the heart block. That effect is completely absent in adults. We also asked our people to Adele, remember... It's, is it because... Do you have to press on the opposite hand? Yes. Is that the only reason? You can do any kind of rule. You can, any kind of task where you just in, have to change what you were doing before. And we adults will immediately relax into doing that if that's what we have to do for all the trials. But children don't do that. It, no matter how many trials you give them, they have the effect of the first thing they had to do or their natural inclination of how you should do it. Make sense? Good. Um, we also had people try to remember arbitrary rules, like for one stupid shape you press left and for another stupid shape you press right. <laughs> and then after they remembered two rules, we gave them four more, so they had six rules to remember. Even very young children have excellent memories. The difference in their performance when inhibition is required so the difference of going from hearts to flowers is greater for children than the difference of going from two rules to six. The opposite is true for us adults. Increasing memory demands is far more difficult for us it's on inhibition. <laughs> Go dumb, and then Jebel Pazloeg, Chow Jebloid, and then 
But very few three-year-olds can switch. This is a different kind of switching now, right? So we're not changing the side, we're changing the concept. And I want to show you this. You're going to hear a child who's very verbal about what she's going through. So you may want to chuckle, but chuckle to yourself so you can hear the little girl. Yes, it's a video. Can we have sound? Louder? Excellent. And where do the stars go? Good job. Louder? This is a truck. Where does it go? Go ahead. So, trucks go here and stars go here. Here we go, Caleb. This is a star. Where does it go? Excellent. Okay. Now we're going to start playing a color game. Remember, in the color game, red ones go here and blue ones go here. So, The blue one, where does it go? Go ahead. Remember, we're playing the color game. And in the color game, blue ones go here and red ones go here. So this is a blue one, where does it go? Where do you think it goes? Where do you think it goes? ไม่ได้ก็ทําเงี้ยเลยทําเงี้ยเลยอีกเออสิสิสิสิสิสิสิสิสิสิสิสิสิสิสิสิสิสิสิสิสิสิสิสิสิสิสิสิสิสิสิ
Children make very few mistakes, three-year-olds, on the first dimension, but they make many mistakes on the second dimension. You'll be pleased to know that we adults don't do that. But if you look at how fast we respond, you see the same pattern in adults that you see in children in accuracy. So look at this. The next slide is adults. We're much faster on the first block, on the first dimension, than we are on the second dimension. In fact, uh, if we can give adults many more trials than children. If you start with color, you're faster on color the whole time. And if you start with shape, you're faster on shape the whole time. Adults show many of the same cognitive biases that characterize young children, that make us laugh when young children do them. Though in we adults, these biases are more subtle and held more in check because we are better able to inhibit them. Okay, now to get to how to improve, try to improve executive control. One way is an early education program which is based on the teachings of a Russian psychologist named Vygotsky. Vygotsky emphasized the importance of social pretend play for the development of executive control. Social pretend play is making believe that you're um, um, uh, the mommy and somebody else is the baby, or you're the policeman and somebody else is a criminal. Okay? If you're doing that, you have to hold in mind what role you picked and what roles your friends picked. You have to inhibit acting out of character. So if you're the baby, you can't all of a sudden tell mommy what to do. You have to stay in your role. And then your friends may take that play scenario in ways you never imagined because you're just making it up as you go. So you need working memory, you need inhibition, and you need cognitive flexibility. All three executive control skills, and the children just think they're playing. Now, when executive control activities were tried as something added on to an existing curriculum, so for example, maybe between 10 to 11 in the morning, children would do executive control activities, the children improved on what they practiced, but the benefits didn't generalize to other contexts or other executive control skills. For the benefits to generalize to other contexts and other executive control skills, training in and challenges to executive control needed to be integrated in all school activities throughout the day. So if you're doing a literacy activity or a math activity, you still needed part of that to be addressing executive control. So one example of that in a literacy activity is to tell the children four years of age or five years of age to get into pairs and to each get a picture book and be prepared to tell the other child the story that goes with the pictures in your book, to read to the other child. Well, if both children are ready to tell their story, nobody wants to listen. Everybody wants to tell their story. And if you try to ask a four-year-old or a five-year-old to wait, you're wasting your breath. It doesn't work. So what they do in, in here, in Tools of the Mind, is let me see if I can find my mouse, is they give one child a picture of a, mouth, of a mouth, you can't see that here, and the other child a picture of an ear. And they explain that ears don't talk, ears listen. And with that concrete reminder, the children actually listen. <laughs> Bef if you don't have that, they don't. And after a few months, they don't need that anymore. They've internalized it. So they give them supports so that they succeed. And then as they get better and better, they remove the supports gradually.
<laughs> okay. Another example is young children, five, six years of age, will often do mirror reversals in their writing. It's very normal, um, and teachers um, find it very hard to get them to change. So usually teachers wait till they grow out of it. But this program has something which immediately gets children to stop doing that. What they tell the children is this afternoon when you do your assignment, every time you have to write the number or the letter that you reverse, put down your pencil and pick up a red pencil. That's all they tell them. And after that afternoon, never again mirror reversals, like a miracle. To understand why that works, to understand why that works, I wanted to go to a test I developed years ago for children. On this test, there are cards. And when you see a black card with a moon, you're to say day. And when you see a white card with a sun, you're to say night. So you have to hold two rules in mind and inhibit saying what the cards really represent. Four-year-olds have trouble doing this, but it seemed to us that they knew what they should do, but they were too um, impulsive, too eager to respond, and didn't give themselves the time they needed to figure out the answer. So we felt they needed to wait, but if you ask a four-year-old to wait, it doesn't work. So we needed to figure out a way to get them to work. And the way we figured out was after we show the child the card, we sing a little song to the child. Very short, but it get, it, the child doesn't respond till after we're finished with our song. Now, you might think that singing to the child would interfere with their calculating the right answer. But what you find is that if you don't do that, children are a chance. But if you do the little song, they're up about 90% correct. Now, if you sing that song between trials, before you show the card, it doesn't help because they don't yet know what the answer should be, so they can't use it to calculate. It only helps if you show after you see the card. Now, I'm going to show another video. Normally, we don't have the same child do both the song and regular, but we, for the purposes of having a film company come, we did both. First, you'll see the child do standard, and you'll see that he knows the right answer, but sometimes he impulsively gives the wrong answer and then immediately corrects himself. Or sometimes he's so eager to respond, he answers before I even show the card. But you'll see how different he is with the song. Now, I must apologize to everyone. I am a terrible singer, but I didn't want to embarrass anyone else in my lab, so you have me doing this. The child will say morning or night. Sound? Okay, I just stopped it so that we could get sound. I'll go right back. My volume's up. Yes, yeah. So what do you say when what you see this? Ah. Mm -hmm. Okay, one minute. In this game, 
when you see this white card with the sun, you're supposed to say night. Can you say night? Good. And when you see this black card with the moon, you're supposed to say day. Yes. So what do you say when you see this? Night. Yes. And what do you say when you see this? Yes! Can we try it once more? This time, I'm going to sing a little ditty after I show you the card. And I don't want you to answer till after I'm finished singing, okay? Can we try that? Okay. So, think about the answer. Don't tell me. Now, can you tell me? What do you say? Think about the answer. Don't tell me. Now, what do you say? Think about the answer. Don't tell me now. Think about the answer. Don't tell me now. Think about the answer. Don't tell me now. Okay. Um, what you noticed is the child had two problems. One is the child is too impulsive and doesn't wait as long as the child needs to get the answer out. But that would not be a problem if the child could quickly figure out the answer. The problem is that the child is both impulsive and slow. If the child was um, um, able to calculate the answer quickly, it wouldn't matter if he was impulsive. It's that he has both problems. Now, the um, reversed writing did the same thing as my song. The child had an automaticity of doing this reversal in writing. And in order to get the child to break it, we needed to give him time to do what he knew he should do. But to ask him to wait wouldn't work. So they asked him to put his pencil down and pick up a different pencil. And that just gave him the time to do the right thing and broke the habit. We looked at where the children in Tools of the Mind showed better executive control and academic progress than comparable children in an excellent program that differed only in not having activities to train and challenge executive control. <laughs> And the difference was significant? Yes, yes, I'll show in a minute. F to study this, we chose activities completely different from anything the children had ever done before. So to see an effect, the children would have to transfer their training in executive control to completely new situations. So we gave them the hearts and flowers task. This is a child doing that. Um, when they just have the flower block, they just do flowers, children in tools of the mind did better than children in the other curriculum. This is significant, but it's not that big, a difference. Here is the harder mixed block. Most of the children in the other curriculum could not even demonstrate during practice that they could do this at all. They were completely unable to do mixing of flowers and hearts. But most of the children in the tools program could do that. This is not only a significant difference, it's a big difference. We had another measure I won't go into. The children in the other condition were performing a chance. The children in tools were performing at about 85% correct. That's a big difference. 
and that was published in Science. Better academic performance in children in the program that improved executive control has been replicated with other children and other teachers in other schools and states and with different comparison conditions. Okay, now lessons to learn from this. Executive control skills can be improved even in children as young as four or five without expensive, highly technical equipment by regular teachers in regular classrooms. Secondly, though teachers, at least in the West, are being pressured to allow less time for play, to have more time for academic instruction, play is important. Children who spend more time at play perform better academically than comparable children who receive more direct academic instruction. The next one is feedback loops, and I will explain. If you start school with poor executive control, you have problems like yelling the answer out when you should be quiet, or not staying in your seat, or taking things from other children, or not paying attention for long enough. So the teacher is always yelling at you, and you're getting poor grades. The teacher comes to expect you not to perform well, you come to expect yourself not to perform well, and you think this is no fun at all. I want to go away from here. Then imagine the child who begins school with good executive control. You're able to sit in your seat and pay attention, and the teacher says, what a pleasure you are. I wish I had a whole class of children like you. And you're able to do your assignments, you get good grades, you think, hmm, I kind of like this. I want to invest in being part of this thing that makes me feel so good about me. Poor children start school with slightly less good executive control than more advantaged children. And poor children fall farther and farther behind more advantaged children each year they are in school. 통화한 고수 배가 개발시다면 executive control 축지 좀 유망한 것도 안 해. 아니 로레 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 내는 거. Farther behind in their academic performance. That widening achievement gap may result from the actions of two opposite feedback loops, beginning with small initial differences in executive control. So one feedback loop is going in the negative direction and the other feedback loop is going in the positive direction. I predict that helping poor children improve their executive control skills early might help close that achievement gap and reduce social inequalities. A small improvement in executive control early might set a positive feedback loop in motion, and that might produce increasing benefits each year a child is in school. The recent explosion in diagnoses of ADHD might be due in part to some children never learning to exercise executive control. I predict, and we're now testing, that an early education program that improves executive control will not only lead to better school outcomes, but to better mental health outcomes. Many issues are not simply education issues or health issues, they are both. Okay, my last thing to talk about other ways to improve executive control. Many, Many people are interested in using sitting meditation, concentrating in your breath, to help young children improve executive control. But little children of four or five ha find it too hard to sit still for long periods. It's not appropriate for their age. But this is an example of a walking meditation exercise that is appropriate for such young children. Everyone, even the adults, gets a bell, and 
everybody follows the leader and walks in a line or a circle. The goal is that no one should make a sound with their bell. That's a kind of meditation that even a four-year-old can can do. One thing we might talk about after I'm finished, which will be very soon, is what other age-appropriate meditative exercises do you know of for children that young? Okay, martial arts is another thing that helps improve executive control. For example, Taekwondo has been shown to improve executive control and also academic performance. I want to end by talking about two extraordinary programs. One is Venezuela's national system of youth and children orchestras. It's known as El Sistema. It's the brainchild of a Venezuelan economist who also happened to be a conductor and composer, Jose Antonio Abreu, who envisioned classical music training as a social intervention that could transform the lives of poor children. The other program is the National Dance Institute, NDI, in New York City. It was founded by the remarkable, irrepressible Jacques D'Amboise, a famous ballet dancer and recipient of many honors, including the National Medal of Honor. Jacques came from a poor family, dropped out of school, and was headed for trouble. He happened to walk his sister to dance class one day, and it changed his life. So he founded NDI to help other troubled youths through dance. Both programs were started in the mid-1970s, and both have reached hundreds of thousands of children, especially poor children. The Venezuelan program has been so successful that it has spread to 26 other countries in South America and Central America. Both programs serve all children. The orchestra even serves children who are deaf, and the dance program even serves children in wheelchairs. And both are, com are provided completely free, so even poor children can participate. Both programs require the children to work hard. They have to exercise discipline and persistence and practice. They hold the children to very high standards. They challenge the children. They are cognitively demanding. You have to hold information in mind. You have to remember sequences. You have to pay careful attention. Both involve physical activity. Even, an or even to play an instrument requires visual motor coordination. Both give the children a wonderful sense of self-confidence and pride. And you'll see in the video the joy on the children's faces. And both provide social support and social belonging. This is not individual performance. The children perform as part of a group. The children help one another, listen to one another, and respect one another. Each is an important part of the whole. So both of these programs address our intellect, our physical motor, our social being, and our emotions. And all of those are an important part of who we are. And it's important to address each of those, not just one or the other. In the West, we too often focus just on the intellect. It's not good. OK, so this is a video. First, it's El Sistema. Then it's uh, a National Dance Institute. Uh, El Sistema is in Venezuela, so the people speak in Spanish. Don't worry about catching every word. It's not that important. Oh, we need sound. Let me, oh, one second. Nosotros vamos a pensar que vivimos en un barrio, en un barrio humilde, que hay inseguridad. Nosotros a pesar no han dado educación. Hay muchas personas que dicen, él vive en un barrio y no le han dado educación. Era el primer día de la orquesta de cámara, entonces yo venía temprano y me dijeron, mm, 
Entonces me dieron un disparo en la pierna y no podía ir. Y entonces yo llorando porque no me dolía, me dolía la pierna, pero más me dolía que no iba a estar aquí el día ese en lo que estaba de cama. Y se le olvida cuando uno llega aquí, se le olvida todo, todo, todo. El profesor nos dice, toquen pero con su corazón, no con, no con la mente, con el corazón. En Venezuela nosotros estamos en este momento trabajando para un universo de beneficiarios que se calcula en 265 mil jóvenes y niños, pero esto es apenas el comienzo. Nosotros estamos aprendiendo a tocar trompeta como para sacar nuestra familia adelante. Estamos para adelante como el elefante. I started National Dance Institute because I had a, no other choice in my life. And I wanted children to have the joy that came to me in my life from learning in the arts and being a child. The basis of the NDITT is setting high standards for children. NDI teachers just don't accept mediocrity. I want to see who gets to knees the highest. I go first, I go We set the bar really high, and you know what? Children come to that place. I mean, you go in there with those expectations, and they rise to them. Like a lot of steps, they seem really hard. But if you really learn them, they're very, very easy. And you're like, wow. I thought it was so much more difficult, but it's really not. We don't ask them to do any more than they're capable of, but we challenge them so far beyond what they ever thought they were capable of. You'll see a transformation when you go watch an NDI class. When you are young and you do something positive, you've achieved something. That sticks with you all your life. Take his arm and show him. Show him his arm. The children learn to help each other. They learn to understand that each one of them is an important element to the success of the whole team. As a kid, it's like if you're in class and you feel like you're not succeeding in class, NDI was the one place where if you didn't get the step, you didn't quit. You had everyone supporting you and encouraging you, and you got it. It's all right, it's OK, because the smile in the face, bravo. I shudder to think what I might be doing if NDI hadn't come along when they did. NDI made me feel special because no one else no one else did they took a chance on a kid they didn't even know we hear all the time that kids gain a kind of confidence that they're able to do so much more in their lives than they had ever expected the focus of the NDI program is the in-school program it's a program that happens during the school day to underscore our belief that the arts should be part of every child's education so the NDI class partners with schools and we provide the program for an entire grade level it's not an audition program every child participates and if they commit they are guaranteed success it's not an easy program the movement itself is very challenging and they're constantly changing directions changing counts people are doing things at different times that's a big concept for kids at this age it's a lot easier to focus because when you learn to focus on something that's fun sometimes if you want to you can learn to focus on something that's not so fun. <laughs> NDI is like that one little spark you come across one time and never find it again. <laughs> if you <laughs> want it, you need to grab <laughs> hold <laughs> and hold on tight because NDI will take you places Okay, Beth, thank you. Um, let me see if I can go on. This is, I'm at the end, I just have two questions. Um, would any of these practices or activities, tools of the mind, dance, or any of the others, be appropriate in Tibetan schools? What practices or activities are used with Tibetan children to improve their attention and executive control? Thank you so much. Thank you, Adele. Thank you. Thank you, Adele. Um, I think we should use this opportunity to start our discussion with these questions. And so we should maybe make a 15 minutes tea break. No. Thank you. 
Okay. Thank you. You can come back. Yeah. No, such a, such Raise such your the first question, and then we can lead on into the second one. I was wondering if the programs I talked about, like Tools of the Mind, with the children being the reader and the listener, or the dance program, or the orchestras, any of those, would be appropriate for Tibetan children. And if there are other ways that people use with young Tibetan children to help improve their attention and executive control. What can we learn from how um, uh, uh, your colleagues help um, children improve their executive control? I think answer is very simple. Answer I think very simple. We Tibetan also human beings. No differences. Same blood. I think same brain. <laughs> so certainly we need this new technique. Very good. Wonderful. That's very good. Daniel Gandhi uh then Puzgan Soro Chigitine the kindergarten to Ajit that uh Yarva Put the Zutang mixing training champ day. So, <clears throat> of course, we have many Tibetan schools, such as the Tibetan Children's Village there, which has many different levels of grades. So, uh, I think... In, in all settlement, the kindergarten, very young children there. So, of course, uh, we are a refugee community, uh, small number. Uh, of course, this is not a political statement. Uh, of course, the reality is the remaining six million Tibetan inside Tibet, no freedom. The education system is just indoctrination. So, only about 100,000, 150,000 Tibetan in a free country uh, have the opportunity is it, to study properly, right? Uh, and small number, which actually, I think, we are, we are working. Uh, our very existence is something like on behalf of remaining six million Tibetan. So small number here, training, education, uh, properly, because we are grown, bringing grown up, back, bringing up, bringing up at most important. What? So, uh, so the Oculus show, you know, the share, I don't know if you need to take me out. So, it's, uh, Stolen is wondering what would be the, the actually the, the logistics and the practical steps to see if, explore if something like this could be introduced to the Tibetan uh, children. And of course, the need and importance seems to be very, you know, evident. Um, the two women who developed the program I studied um, could come and show teachers how to do it. Uh, it's not a program that you can learn just from reading, from a manual. You need to get personal uh, instruction and feedback oh, on yes. what you do. Right, right, right. Um, right. Very important, yes. But I also mm. feel that no one program has all the right answers. So it doesn't mean that replicating exactly tools of the mind is best. A little bit of tools of the mind and maybe a little bit from other approaches could also be very beneficial. Because many people have a little bit of knowledge and, and good ideas. And if you can bring them together, then you can benefit much. Mm -hmm. um, but my, I wonder what your schools do now to help children get um, get better control of their attention. <laughs> what do you do with four-year-olds or five-year-olds? I don't know. <laughs> 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 I myself, is it bringing, not Project. that way. No. Right. <laughs> oh, uh, I grown up or uh, study uh, under my tutors was say Kasa. Weep. Yeah, Weep. the supervision with the whip. 
<laughs> that executive control? <laughs> Unfortunately, I think the, the, our scholars, our, uh, the, uh, I think the genuine practitioner, of course, they are uh, the way bringing up is very strict. Uh, not this kind of thing, but uh, uh, somehow many of them, their mind, uh, they are very sharp. Uh, of course, most important, I think sharpness of mind, warm-heartedness, I think as a result, I think immense benefit. That much I can say, according to my own experience. <laughs> oh, and then also is it learning by heart? Memorization is an Memorize, important yeah. part. It's very excellent. Um, training for executive control and memory. Also, storytelling is a wonderful way to help children develop executive control because mm -hmm. they have to pay careful attention and they have to hold the information in mind and relate what you're saying now to what you said earlier. Storytelling is wonderful for developing executive control. How does storytelling differ from just watching TV? Med developmental, because obviously we have, particularly in the West, we have a culture which is based education through TV. Yes. So could you explore there on that? There are two important ways. One is storytelling differs even from picture books or video because you don't have the visual support. You don't have the ear and the mouth to see. So you have to hold things in mind more. So without the visual aid, you're already advancing executive control development. But computers and videos usually assume you have very short attention span. So they keep changing what's there to pull you in because they assume you will wander. So they don't help you develop sustained attention because they assume you don't have it. And also, it's an isolated activity. You do it by yourself. Also, you do these things by yourself. You work on the computer alone. And that uh, um, isn't as powerful for developing executive control as social situations. There was a study in Russia that looked at five-year-olds a little while ago and looked at five-year-olds 30 years ago. And they found that five-year-olds 30 years ago were two years advanced in executive control compared to five-year-olds now. And I think that part of that has to do with now we are doing things more individually and on the computer. Before, we used to play with our friends. You get home from school, you play sports outside, you make up games together, you're doing things socially. I think that that is important for developing executive control. <laughs> David, a short question or <laughs> statement? Comment. Comment and question. So, as you may know, Your Holiness, the Mind and Life Institute is preparing to have a meeting in Washington, D.C. on education and the mind in October. And as part of preparing for this, there has been much discussion by the Mind and Life 
education research network about kinds of training that have been used previously in Tibetan Buddhist monasteries. And in particular, at one of our meetings, there was considerable discussion about the role of debate training. And on the basis of what Adele has said, it sounds like the Tibetan Buddhists, at least for adolescents, have evolved the very best possible kind of training program for uh, increasing executive control because it sounds to me like debate training, if I understand it, does all and everything that Adele has suggested would be good for training the mind in executive control. Perhaps you could comment, it, comment on this further? ペジュジリディシャケシュイズリ。ペチュジリディシャケシュイズリ。ペチュジリディシャケシュイズリ。ペチュジリディシャケシュイズリ。ペチュジリディシャケシュイズリ。ペチュジリディシャケシュイズリ
subjects, yes, say yes. like law or Absolutely. or uh, study of biology or whatever. So it could be developed to a point where it can be applied independent of the content, which is at the moment the Buddhist, um, you know, Buddhist field. But sometimes um, I joke, half joke, half serious, uh, particularly those students who study law uh, eventually become lawyer. Uh, maybe good to this is, to through debate uh, this debate uh -huh. uh, in order to defeat other one <laughs> <laughs> so they 'll be able to really pe press on the fine tuning of the meaning of what is being said uh, <laughs> In fact, uh, the elementary st um, stage of uh, debate training is known as dura collected topics. And uh, so there, there is a saying that if the debater can uh, disprove what is being said to be the case and prove what is being rejected by the opponent, then that's the mark that he or she has mastered the technique. Yes, <laughs> yes. Sazang, modern education and all your something. So this is something that may have a beneficial application in the modern education context as well. Uh, uh, since uh, I think at least in a few decades uh, I had sort of view and many of my friends you see agree uh, modern education system uh, not adequate pay attention about <laughs> ethics or the inner sort of quality inner quality uh, and now, uh, there are uh, I think two different views. One view, uh, moral ethics must be based on religious faith. It is true, in some extent, true. All major religious traditions, you see, they, their basic message is moral ethics. Love, compassion, forgiveness, tolerance, these things. Uh, Self-discipline, like that. Uh, but, uh, uh, other hand, another sort of view, uh, there can be different levels of ethics. ethics. Uh, on, on broader level, or I think the uh, fundamental, level. Uh, fundamental level, you see, naturally, there are sort of universal sort of value. Now, for example, affection, uh, respect each other, and consider other as a human brother, sister. It's just you see, the concept of we extend entire six billion human beings. Not emphasis we and they. And we with a small circle. Then finally oneself. Then all these troubles. So our sort of attitude, because of the whole world, whole six billion human beings, whole planet, is part of we. I have to take care. If something goes wrong, other side, I will lose. Suffer. I will suffer. suffer. So that nothing to do with the religion. This is reality, isn't it? We are social animal. I think. I think. I think you mentioned. I think those those children mixing with more more children, their mind more because of the happier That's and right. something. Then through that way, self confidence. These things help. Yes. So the lonely, isolated. Right? isolated then more fear, more doubt, like that, isn't it? Yes, mm. yes. Uh, so now here, uh, I usually call, uh, and many Indians fully sort of agree, yeah. secular way, nothing to do with religion. But some my friend, uh, 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 some Muslim, also some uh, Christian, uh, or one, one time in Germany, I think many years ago, I think more than 10, 15 years ago, uh, uh, I just talked, uh, I was referring to this, this problem, and he mentioned oh, moral ethics must be based on religion. religion faith. Faith. Then very difficult mm. uh, in public sort of education. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. you should, you should, how? Uh, it was very difficult to, 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 bring uh, to, to bring in curriculum. Yes, uh, moral ethics must be based on religion, 
Then more complication. What religion? Which <laughs> religion? Hmm? Theist religion, non-theist religion. Theist religion, still again, Christianity, Judaism, <laughs> Judaism, Islam. or Islam, like that. Difficult. And particularly like India, impossible. Multi-religious sort of nation, impossible. Uh, so we now, uh, I think now you may you may boring. No, no, Too very, long. very interesting. Hmm? Please, no, absolutely not. It's, it's central. Uh, uh, I always uh, telling these people or expressing people in in uh, in reality. I think six. Now, generally say about thousand million. Islam, Muslim, thousand million Christian, six hundred or seven hundred Hindus, is it? Hindu, and Buddhist maybe few hundred, two two hundred or two hundred millions, huh? Four hundred. Four hundred. Huh? Now here you see we must include Chinese Buddhist brothers sisters. Oh, right, right. No practice. Uh, so, uh, but if you ask, if you examine s seriously, these uh, one thousand Christian, uh, one one thousand million Christian and Muslim and the Hindus and Buddhists, uh, when they are happy, yes, claim I'm Buddhist, <laughs> I'm Christian. Okay, when things become difficult, I don't think. Much serious sort of uh, much seriousness no. about religion. Uh, always say God, God, but we pay more attention about money. The other day, dollar, more yes. important than God. Yes. <laughs> very clear. <laughs> uh, oh, what a portion! That was ants. Yeah. ants. ants. Oh. <laughs> uh, so that's the reality. We Buddhist monk also, we always talk contentment, contentment. But oneself need more money, more dollar. <laughs> mm. So we are not very serious. So, uh, as a Buddhist, we always say the destructiveness, destructiveness of our destructive emotions. emotions. While we are saying that, but we are ourselves still slave of these destructive emotions. So therefore, uh, in in reality, majority of six billion human beings, I don't think really serious religious Why did we believe Islam. So, what, so naturally, these are majority. So, some ethics should include these non-believers. So, naturally, uh, secular, secular ethics, secular ethics. Even to some extent, animal, some animal, particularly social animals, and also see those. I think practically all every animal which their life, because begin with mother, whether through egg or from because um, 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 from womb, you see, their sort of survival, survival entirely depend on others' care. The, in order to maximum care, there must be some energy. Bring by will. Oh. That will come from affection. Whether you call love or affection, without that, mother will not pay much attention about caring. So therefore, biologically, these things equipped. Biologically, right. right. So that is seed of compassion. So these animals, no religion, <laughs> no constitution, no police force, but by biological factor, is it they take maximum care about their young one. So that's nature. I mean, nature, right? that's nature. nature. So that also is in our case. That's the seed of our compassion. So naturally, now that uh, nothing to do with religion. So now that 
take as a seed. And then, Kasore, with awareness of usefulness of that, mm. now like uh, the, uh, science, science, uh, those science, scientists, hmm? the particularly medical scientist, so now they clearly sort of Kasoda, realize no. the more compassionate person, their mind more calm. As a result, health better. Even a lot of disturbances uh, in deep down, still you can keep calm mind. So, so therefore, so through that way, uh, usually I, 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 I describe using our common sense and common experience and then latest scientific finding. On this basis, we can develop new curriculum about moral ethics, which can Kadoda, Kadoda, brought into. Well, we, then uh, can be in modern school from kindergarten. We can introduce nothing to do with religion. Uh, so that's my view. So, uh, so many occasion in England or in America. In many places, in Japan, I express using these things. So, uh, uh, of course, the people, those all, the all audience, you see, seems to say, uh, agree. But now we need someone who actually carrying Kasuda, the initiative, uh, Kasuda, the study, the research. No. Uh, I'm, I'm, I have not, not that, uh, that, that not ability. Person, no. I just because of the yeah, express. Yeah. I okay. think I can I can say on behalf of those weak people who really suffer out of affection, lack, lack, lack of affection, mm -hmm. exploitation, mm -hmm. politically, militarily, or economically. Uh, all these problems ultimately related with here. Problem not come from gun user, isn't it? Ultimately here. Yeah. But nobody sort of because of the pay serious attention. attention about that. That's right. We take for granted anger, hatred, these are we take for granted this is part of our nature. So sometimes we deliberately because of the increase in these negative emotions. Yes. Yes. Uh, so I'm i hopefully our next meeting in Karachi, Washington, Washington uh, those experts. Are you are you going to participate? Or planning. Planning. Oh. <laughs> so I'm hoping. You see the the scientist, respected scientist, well known scientist, you have the authority. <laughs> I'm just simple simple Buddhist monk. <laughs> <laughs> And of course, and frankly speaking, I have no sort of, because of no e knowledge. Expertise. Expertise. Uh, expertise. Yeah. Expertise. Authority. Uh. So, so those, those experts, uh, educationists, and also scientists, and the health scientists, or social, or the social scientists, Scientist. come and work to add some kind of concrete plan. Proposals. Uh, Proposals. Proposal. Then maybe some state, individual state, can implement. Then eventually some quite sort of the, uh, as as your sort of the experiment, you see, even or that kind of Venezuela and the New York, New York dance. Uh, uh, they is like that, like that. Yes. You see, they someone implement that. That's right. Then eventually, you see, people recognize or acknowledge some some Benefit. positive result. Then eventually may may possible to because of the, to bring notice at UN or some other sort of world body. Then one when you see the Chinese education system become like that, then I think we Tibetan get real liberation. <laughs> <laughs> Still hated, suspicion, distrust, hated remain there. We will suffer. The Venezuela. <laughs> Oh. 
Yeah. Fortunately, there are already now oh, some good Chinese really showing genuine because of the uh, feeling of concern, concern and solidarity already happening. So that's a positive sign. Like that, I don't know now. The Venezuelan program, mm. which has reached over half a million children, started with 11 children mm. in the man's garage. And from that, it grew. So things can start very small, but <laughs> still can The president of Venezuela. Who is Chavez? Who is Chavez? Who is Chavez? Who is and the program D. And the, and the president got to Marwa. So His Holiness was asking, you know, this program was not initiated by Hugo Chavez, <laughs> is it? No, no, no. <laughs> no. I think he should take as a credit survey. Credit. <laughs> he could take as, credit. as a president of Venezuela. He deserves credit for putting a lot of government money oh. into it. He's Very good. put huge resources Very into good. it and really supported it. Very good. I oh. wanted to come back to a point you said, oh. which was that we accept that negative emotions are natural, oh. and th which is a bad idea. Oh. And in the video, they said that we hold the children to high standards and they rise to them. And I think that if we um, say that negative emotions are not natural, and you, you should be able to overcome them, then if you li have that as the expectation, people will rise to them. Mm. Many teachers of young children assume they can't exercise executive control. They give up. And so the children don't get better because they don't, the teachers don't think that they can do it. Mm. So what you were saying is if you have a low expectation, and you assume hmm. that negative emotions will be there, it doesn't lead to the best result. You need to have the high expectation that they don't have to be there. I'd like to just one question. Say, say one thing tied to the things you mentioned, Your Holiness, about um, secular ethics, about controlling negative emotions, and about how to deal with personally disliked groups or the people that suffer when others, when you're the recipient of being a disliked group. Adele mentioned this morning about working memory. And in the work that I'll talk about this afternoon, we'll, we'll, we can discuss this more. But one thing that has been done, the studies that have been done, have looked at, in adults, individual differences in their capacity for working memory. So how able are you to inhibit, have cognitive flexibility, and maintain information? And there's three very uh, seemingly, th three things that seem like they're totally different from each other, but that are completely related to individuals' working memory capacity. One is the ability to uh, control your emotions. Sure. <laughs> The second is the ability to make ethical uh, decisions that are based on less emotionally reactive qualities of the problem and more logical aspects of the problem. And the third is the ability to control negative or destructive behavior toward personally disliked groups. So these are three separate studies that all tie back together to working memory capacity and how it plays out in these other contexts. And what I, I, I just wanted to bring that up because the thing we think is happening as a function of contemplative practice is increasing working memory capacity. 
So working memory, would you want to explain a little bit what you mean by working memory? That will come this afternoon. And how does that differ from short-term memory? Or is right, it I, I'll same? mention it, I'll just say briefly, I'll talk about it, that's what my afternoon discussion will be with you, is mm. describing what this is, but briefly, it's the ability to both hold and use information over very short periods of time. Uh, Dizzy <laughs> So this is very true. I mean, even, for example, although um, it is a slightly crude characterization of the material world, but in the Buddhist text, when we speak of... The, um, yeah, it's an Abhidhamma Kosha text when it describes the the material substance that make up the material physical world. It talks about uh, um, the atom, which are composed of eight, um, eight different elements. So, um, so the, the understanding here is that um, even at that very subtle level, you know, what we have is a composite. You know, many, many things coming together. So uh, particularly when it comes to the mental domain, sometimes um, when we use language and when we uh, define something and when we conceptualize something, of course, it, it's the function of language and concept that is very selective. It picks up one characteristic and defines it from that particular point of view. But that does not uh, suggest that when these mental factors, processes arise, somehow they arise in this atomic fashion. They are, you know, when the actual experience of these mental processes occur, they are very complex. And, and so interconnected with many other factors, so that um, in order to fully understand their pro you know, operation, we need to have a much more comprehensive, integrated perspective. And some of the, sometimes the influence may be you know, coming from what, you, what happened yesterday, you know, the thoughts that you had yesterday, and some of these influences may even trace back to last decade. So, it's, so we, we, we need to bear in mind that although when we describe these mental factors and mental processes, there is a kind of a slightly atomic approach where we, because we're using language and we're using, you know, concepts and the very nature of the way they function is to select a particular characteristic and latch onto it. But that should not uh, imply that somehow these are independent properties. But when they operate, in order to fully understand the operation, we need to somehow situate them in a much greater network of things that are happening. So that's his role was saying. That's at least oh. how he understands the the uh, Buddhist psychology. So, for example, in India, there's been a lot of discussion on, you know, as part of the philosophy of language. It's not just in Buddhist uh, philosophy, but also in non-Buddhist, uh, you know, kind of Brahminical traditions as well. A distinction has been drawn between the way in which perceptions engage with the object in a much more unmediated, direct uh, interaction, uh, and in contrast, concepts 
or conceptual thoughts uh, engage with objects through a mediation of concepts and language. And so it's, it's an indirect uh, way of engaging with objects. There's been a lot of discussion about the contrast between the two, not just in Buddhism, but also in, um, in Brahminical um, non-Buddhist schools as well. So, for example, when we use a term, the term evokes a concept, and then so this conceptual representation of what is being described should not, cannot capture, you know, completely what is being described. Just so it, one aspect. So it it selects one aspect. Yeah, oh. it focuses on one aspect. So when actually dealing with that, we must keep in our mind the complexity. The complexity, yeah. I would like to bring back the discussion to what Adele was saying today, because I think one of the outstanding features of her presentation was the importance of inhibition. Attention, obviously, our mind is capable to jump on different things, but the technique that is being explained in a Western context here, and I think that's very also true for the Buddhist context, is to actually inhibit jumping on the other distorting or distracting. And in Buddhism, of course, in Tibetan, it's called ngejung. And I think that's a wrong idea to translate that throughout as renunciation, because actually it's a more of a recognizing of where it arises from. And recognizing what comes and uh, appears into your mind so that you can actually say, no, you don't want to engage in that. And of course, within the monastic setting, uh, there are many rules. And Your Holiness, you mentioned that one of the uh, great inhibiting factors was the whip. <laughs> now, are there other techniques that are very specific mm. to actually di uh, differentiating and holding back? That is ハッ。ドカンドスナオカンデシュマチェアゲトンドンドペトンセンテンゲチャチャニェルジョロワ。チキトンドゴンデュネディテジャディ。ああ。ですね、あれが<笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><
then the student side, you see, not only is learning, uh, but also with love, uh, respect, trust. Isn't yes. it? So I think modern subject also, I think, same. The teacher, you act like parent, then students mind all the lesson and really deep inside. So I don't think I need to learn how to work. So I don't think I need to learn how to work. So I don't think I need to learn how to work. Self-discipline. Right. Self-discipline is the same thing. The same thing is the same thing. The same thing is the same thing. The same thing is self-discipline. So from the Buddhist point of view, um, the most kind of um, ideal form of um, inhibitory system really is to have a high degree of degree of self-discipline. And the self-discipline can arise if the person who he or she sees the benefits of what is the pursuit that needs to be done. And, and what are the downsides of not doing this. And if you see the benefits and feel deeply convinced by uh, the value of the pursuit, then it can give rise to a voluntary kind of you know, willingness to do it and leads to a self-discipline. That's our warning in Jutia Tony Mare. So uh the Solans was saying that with relation to um Diego's point about Ngenjung, which is renunciation, his Solans feels that probably it would be impossible to get a true renunciation under the power of a weapon. <laughs> <laughs> so discipline voluntarily, that means self protection. One's own interest. I Although oh all this is some, some part of my mind is I want that. But consequences is very bad for me, for my interest. Knowing that, that's what the restraint, that self discipline, voluntarily, on the basis of awareness, the long term sort of the cons negative consequences. So that means self protection. Self protection. Some discipline. Out of sort of that. imposed, uh, imposed. That's uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That doesn't work. Yeah. Yes, but for young children, sometimes they have the motivation. They want to do the right thing, but they don't have enough in inhibitory okay. control to oh. do what they want. They need to get a little older or have somebody help them improve their executive control at a young age. So they want. But they can't do yet. Uh, it's teaching discipline to a young kid is <laughs> very difficult. Uh, impossible. <laughs> but but I showed it could be done. Yes. You show you showed uh, two examples. One was with the bell, and so obviously that works as a game uh, where you're sort of trying to do that. So would there be other methods that we could sort of import from? Uh, the other tradition into just researching if that works. Yeah, I was uh, sorry, I was sl slightly stepping outside my role as an interpreter. I was um, um, offering to His Holiness the suggestion that if you look at the monastic education um, at a very young age, memorization, daily memorization is a very important part of the training. So I would argue that this daily memorization really teaches many of the things that you are suggesting because on an average, a very young child, say eight or seven <coughs> year old, will have to memorize three to four stanzas. So each stanza has four lines. So you're talking about 12 lines. And you need to learn to string them together. You need to remember which stanza comes after which. All of this requires a fair bit of, and then <coughs> the, there, it also places a tremendous responsibility on the young child. 
so that in the evening when the time comes he or she has to you know um, rehearse it you know recite it back without the text to the teacher so that really you know, and and somehow the child has to find the time during the day during which he or she has to negotiate between the plays and the memorization time so that by the end of the day this has been done i think you're absolutely right and i think that's probably one of the reasons why russian children 30 years ago oh. were better mm -hmm. because they used to do more memorization mm -hmm. And people today say memorization is bad. Mm -hmm. We want children to understand, etc. And that's important. But I think you're absolutely right that doing memorization early really does train your mind. Mm -hmm. It trains, ex change, trains executive control. I think you're absolutely right. Mathieu, please. Uh, and also on top of that, you do the memorization. You know, in the, in the West, the schools are supposed to be very silent. The teacher is out of the class, he comes in, everybody goes silent. In Eastern schools, where both secular and monastic, they shout. And they don't shout the same thing. They just shout what they are reading or, or memorizing. And when the teacher comes in, they shout even louder because it's what they are supposed to do. <laughs> so that's maybe help also to channel their sort of energy and think that otherwise would be sort of Absolutely. boiling. Absolutely. I think the Western schools expect children to be little adults. And yeah. children aren't meant to sit still for long periods. They need to move. Yeah. They need to do. Uh, traditional Jewish is exactly the same. Yeah. Um, in a Western library, you're supposed to be quiet exactly. and study silently. But Jews always study together. So you go to the Jew, and they're always talking. And you know, they're talking at this table, and they're talking at that table, and they're exactly what you were saying. And then a, se a I second that, point. Uh, 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 I fully agree. <laughs> one, one time, you see, my visit, because uh, my uh, the Jerusalem to Warpa, Jerusalem to Warpa, Israel to Warpa. So he's always on his way to Israel. Uh, from Bombay. The whole sort of, what's that? Whole time, <laughs> some Jewish, oh, never remain silent. <laughs> <laughs> Talk loudly. I'm just I'm just He's was saying that they were, their conversation was totally, you know, sort loud. of a, never ending and quite loud. So normally when he's all in his traveling, he doesn't need to, you know, put earplugs <laughs> to block the aeroplane engine sound. But that evening, he <laughs> felt that he might have to actually <laughs> use the earplugs. <laughs> and the second point is, you know, when you go to a recreation courtyard in the Western schools, there's a lot of turbulence. And also here and there, you can see kids bashing each other. Well, I observe both in monastic uh, elementary schools, where a lot of children you know, from 5 to 12, and in the, all the secular schools that we build in Tibet and helping in Nepal. There's the same playground where they're very active, but it's very, very rare that you see a fight. It's exceptional. And so where does it come from? I think a, a general culture of nonviolence. We know when the parents, by their behavior, when they see a small insect, they will pick it up out of the way and things like that. And also the combination of Secular ethic, I would say. In those secular schools, like one in Nepal, there's 1,000 kids in the courtyard. They do gymnastics. At the end, the principal comes and he does an ethical lecture, human values. And he speaks about good heart. And he does to all the kids. And he's the head of the school. And in Nepal, you know, there's a symbol. If you hold your hair, it's like a pledge. Mm. And they, at the end, they pledge. May I have good heart with my friends. May I have good heart outside. Mm. And he gives them images. He says, no, in some schools in the world, people teach the kid to become suicide bombers. I want you to become peace bombs. When you go out, you will bring peace in your families. And things like And the kids, you could see them. They're so, so inspired. So I think all these things together, yes. the culture, yes. the fact that ethical values are brought and taught and spoken about, and it brings this whole feeling. Mm. And so I think there's something maybe uh, yes. you know, that also exists here, mm. and then all those yes. techniques could be yes. blended. Yes. Mm. That's something that should be imported more to the West. Mm. Yes. Yes. Sean? I'm wondering, I'm wondering about uh, meditation now. 
uh, are there meditation practices for young children? Uh, and uh, at what age? What is the appropriate age for meditation to Go start? Yeah, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that means, uh, so for an, I mean, an average <coughs> child in the Tibetan uh, monastic system or generally Tibetan education system, when they get up in the morning, there is a, they would chant the Manjushri mantra. The, this is the mantra of the Buddha of uh, wisdom. And then do a little bit of prayer. And then uh, there is no formal sitting meditation for children. And the only thing that you have comparable is the memorization that they will do on a daily basis. At what age did uh, Your Holiness, uh, what age did you start to meditate? I took six. Six. Meditation. 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 <laughs> so, in terms of strictly speaking, informal sitting meditation, <laughs> not even now. Uh, of course, uh, me, of course, now, uh, I, I realize, and not only myself, but many uh, sincere practitioners, uh, they. Uh, one sort of also the lacking is the single point in mind, mind meditation. Mm -hmm. Meditation. Uh, but uh, as far as sort of uh, change or transformation of our emotion is concerned, analytical meditation is much more effective than single pointed uh, meditation. meditation. So my whole sort of life, whole year. I think six around, I mean, since around, I think, uh, 14, 15, 16. Then I start analytical meditation. And nowadays, of course, every day, from early morning, 3.30, uh, analyze. That's very useful. So anyway, of course, I have no time. The single-pointed sort of uh, meditation. meditation. You need complete sort of silent, quiet yeah. place, and continuously, almost 24 hours, continuously, uh, sort of uh, practice or uh, the training. No training. Then within uh, the quickest, uh, right. Right. quickest time frame. No, minimum time within six months, you may achieve shamatha. Uh, shamatha. For me, impossible. Like that. So then it's, uh, of course, that's merit. Of balance, mm. um. But the Chaju Sam Koba, the Tungi Tao Koba, merit, the Sam Chiji, we think it's Koba merit, and Chiju Shachiro. So within the Buddhist practice, you have many different forms of practices. So you have, for example, the cultivation of the altruistic awakening mind, Bodhicitta, on the one side, and meditation on deepening one's understanding of emptiness. Then you have single pointed meditation, cultivating shamatha. So if you compare these in terms of actual benefits and the merits, then the spending time more on altruistic practices and uh, meditation on emptiness is more beneficial and effect effective than doing shamatha practice. So it's a question of balance. Oh. So, however, um, it is true that after a certain point, if you really need to make further progress, then you do, you, uh, attainment of shamatha is indispensable. Okay. Um, I wanted to go back to what you said about memorization in young children. And this is a question about whether you think that motor movement plays a part in this as well. When I was studying Hebrew, they didn't teach me what it meant. They only taught me to read the letters. And when I would go to pray, I would do what Jews often do, which is to rock back and forth when we did it. 
So I would be saying these things I memorized that I had no understanding of, and I'm Rocky. Uh, um, When um, uh, Buddhist children, Tibetan children, are saying these things they memorized, are they also Rocky? And do you think that is important, or is it just a side thing? Uh, Same. Uh, Jewish, Israel, Muslim. Uh, Muslims. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, Tibetan monks, yeah. Tibetan monks, yeah. Same. So Every Hindu, uh, those who uh, study uh, memorization, I think I think same matter. Right now. The is you the culture you the machine. So it's all in feels that it's more of an automatic kind of <laughs> activity. I don't know why we do this. He Solon says he has no idea. <laughs> in fact, uh, in the formal sitting sessions in the prayer hall. You're not supposed to move too much. You're supposed to sit upright and straight. Uh. I'm just wondering, and I have no idea of the answer, if the movement is somehow important to the development of executive control. If somehow we do it naturally, but is it an important component or just an accidental side thing? I don't know. So there's another tradition, Adele. Um, again, his solace was saying that he is not really sure what it meant, but for example, in the monastic universities, uh, some of the texts that the monks memorize are very long. And then in order to um, ensure that they go into the long-term memory, you have to repeat them for at least about a month, every, you know, possibly, preferably every night. And some of these will take three hours to finish. So when you do that, you uh, generally, the monk would walk up and down in the dark Mm -hmm. without the text, Mm -hmm. And walk up and down, and ah, it will take hours. Interesting. Interesting. It may also <laughs> maybe the simple <laughs> fact that it is it makes you less sleepy. So. Because <laughs> <laughs> otherwise, when you're sitting down and, and re, you know reciting, you know at some point you start dozing off. Yeah. Uh, we think. We should do it now. Yeah, chat with Sajjo. And in fact, in the. In fact, in the monastic disciplinary texts, which are very ancient texts, um, there are references to the need for monks to walk around. Uh, yeah. In our thinking, we often think... Uh, yes. Yes. It, I'll be very short. Sure. In our thinking, we often think of thinking, cognition, and motor as separate. But in the brain, they are not separate. The same brain regions that are important for motor are also important for cognitive. So it may be that this movement is, uh, is somehow that we don't understand yet an important component. And maybe the phenomenological side yeah, has something to say about that. I'm, I'm going to talk about just that kind of thing on, on Friday. And in fact, I'm going to cite one of your papers. Um, but I wanted to bring up uh, a recent study of ADHD um, where, uh, you know, young, young children fidget a lot. Uh, people who suffer from uh, attention deficit disorder fidget, move uh, when they're trying to do something. And it has has been the practice of teachers trying to calm them down, you know, sit still and pay attention and so forth. And a recent study has shown that, uh, uh, in fact, the movement helps them pay attention. Um, And it might be because, you know, then they don't have to pay attention to try to sit still, but they can can just do whatever they have to do, and the attention goes to what they are trying to accomplish. Well, I think that has been very 
developmental for our understanding. Um, so it's half past and we're going to have a quick lunch and then we gather again at before one o'clock, please. Thank you.